Okay, so I would like to discuss today about mathematical models in ecology, and maybe um, a, a better title would be uh, examples of a few mathematical models and how they can be useful. So it's not, the idea is not to give a general um, lecture on, on mathematical models for biology because it would be too, too long, but just um, a few examples of things I have uh, been working on recently. And this will be associated to an exercise class where uh, I, I, I did choose some exercise that have some uh, interaction with the lecture. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this, what I will present has been done in collaboration with uh, collaborators. So there's uh, Pascal Maillard, Julie Tournier on the first work, and then Mathieu Alfaro, Henri Berestiki, and Ophélie Rons on the second, uh, second work. As you know, uh, there's a climate change that is ongoing right now. And uh, the effect of that is to raise the temperatures. So this is clearly visible here. We see that we have a global trend with temperatures going up since the 1970s, and this is not gonna stop anytime soon. So there are lots of work on uh, people working on climate science to try to give some forecasts for that. So typically the things that are difficult to, to understand is uh, how this will impact uh, precipitations or extreme events or things like that. But for temperature, actually, it's really easy to, to, to guess what's going to happen. And uh, for us, we'll not be worried about that. We'll consider that the prediction of weather forecast uh, uh, are done and reliable. And we'll focus on the impact of that on biological populations, where much less work has been done so far. So the first point I want to, to discuss is niche models. These are the models that are typically used nowadays to try to understand the consequence of climate change on biological populations. And then we'll move on to uh, different models to try to, to, to give a different view on this type of questions. So in 2003, we had this, uh, uh, sorry. This, um, this work by, uh, sorry, this work by uh, Wilfried Tullier uh, on uh, beech tree. The beech tree is a tree like that, right? This one, it's the same family as the oak tree or the chestnut trees that are maybe a little bit more uh, well-known, but uh, you have all encountered it. It's used a lot for furniture. So the wood that you have here on these chairs is, is a beech tree. And it's a tree that is present everywhere. So you have the European beech here, you have the Asian one, you have the American one, and it's an emblematic uh, species of uh, European forests. And the authors, they started with this gray area, which is the current range of the population where this tree is present at the moment or in 2003 in Europe, and they try to understand what's going to happen in the future. And what they came out with was this map here. So you have here the light gray area where the, the beach tree population will be able to go, right? So new territories where it, will, it could appear. And then you have all those gray areas here where it will disappear. And as you see, for France, it's not so good. So the prediction is that the beech tree will mostly disappear from France. Uh, so that's a bit worrying. And um, this was presented with typically forest managers, insurance companies, everyone that is involved in the um, forestry business. And they were really worried about that because the beech tree is one of the important trees in France. And to grow it, you need 60 years. So if you count 60 years and all the trees in France will be dead by 2060, uh, sorry, 2080, well, it, it's very worrying. And so they asked some questions which were, well, should we change our management settings? So for instance, should we go for shorter uh, lifespans for the trees? So this would a little bit lower the yields compared to 60 years, but you have, you can adapt your management strategy, have more trees, even though they are smaller. And so that's something you need to anticipate. Or should we do something even more drastic, which is to change 
the species of tree you, you grow. So you go from this, which are those beech trees, to, for instance, Douglas fir trees, which are more resistant to, to, to heat. But uh, when you do that, of course, you destroy completely the ecosystem. The species that can survive here are not the same as the ones that can survive there. You impact the ability of the, of the soil to absorb water, and you impact a lot of things. So that's a pretty drastic measure. And before applying those drastic measures, you need to be sure that the predictions made with that model are reliable and to, to discuss the limitations of uh, this reliability. So let's see a little bit more how those niche models are made. So they start from two types of data. You have first a presence absence map for the species at the current time. So you try to define the area where the species is present. So here it's for an insect, and you see that uh, it's present in these parts of Australia. Uh, so before, it was very difficult to get such data, but now with uh, citizen science, where uh, people from the general public can enter uh, information about their favorite species, for instance, about uh, people who like birds, can, uh, can, can give some information of where they see which kind of birds. So we have a lot more data now. So this is improving rapidly. So that's the first type of data. And the second type of data is information about the type of soil or the climate. So we have, for instance, World Clean, which is uh, the, uh, uh, something that is organized by the United Nations to try to track the climate right now and to give some predictions for the future. So you have a presence absence map and some environmental data, and you can try to find the correlation between the two, which is what environmental data allows a species to be present. This is what you call a niche. Okay, this is what I, is represented here. The niche of the species, the environmental conditions that allows its survival. And then you just go forward in the future using the climatic uh, climate predictions, and you try to see where the species could be in the future. So this is what is employed now for uh, to create that uh, maps, prediction maps that are used by, uh, by uh, decision makers. Okay, um, so the question, yeah, sorry. There's already a question from Medvey Sirianov. Are beech trees disappearing due only to anthropological reasons? Uh, well, <laughs> at the moment, we don't know if they, they are disappearing, right? This, this, is, um, this is a prediction. This hasn't been tested yet, right? So there's a pretty big problem of testing. So here it would be just the, the simple consequence of climate change. And that would be the prediction of climate change for the next 60 years. Uh, whether this is going to happen or not is part of the question. OK, that's what we are going to try to do. To, but, but, but what I can say uh, more generally is that uh, human is, uh, is a leading species on Earth. So it has a big impact on, on everything, I would say. OK. Um, so is it true that? Um, uh, niche model works. So uh, to, to, to discuss that, people have, um, have tried to go back to old data sets because uh, those changes can be subtle. They take a lot of time, right? So the, as we saw with the climate uh, uh, data, the temperature go up, but there can be lots of uh, uh, oscillations and things. So if you want to have a clear impact of the climate change, you need to, to go for a, a long period of time. So you need to have all data sets. And this is the case. So they went to something that was established in 1910 in uh, the Yosemite Park. They consider a slab of a mountain like that. You start from almost sea level all the way to 3,000 meters. And the idea is the higher you go, the colder the climate. Right. So if, you, if it's true that um, the, the species um, will move because of climate change, you expect that they will go up the mountain, right? They will to follow the climate that is suitable for them. And so they considered the 26 species that had been collected uh, by Grinnell in 1910 and tried to see 
uh, what is, how the range of these species did, uh, did change. And the results are a bit contrasted. There are some species here for, for which almost nothing changed. Some species that saw their range contract and some that saw their range expand. So it's a bit difficult to give some conclusion, but we can notice, however, that in these species that contracted, most of the time, the retraction came from uh, the bottom part of their range. So they did indeed go up the mountain, and it is the same for the expansion. The expansion is the top part that did go up in most of the species. So we seem to see something like uh, a, a shift to follow the climate, but it's not as, as, um, as clear as we, we, we could expect. And there are other type of data. So here it's uh, about mar marine uh, sea creatures and to see if they go they tend to be shifted towards the poles or not. And it's a very rough uh, uh, study because you see here, for instance, you have bivalves or reptiles, right? Entire gender. Uh, it seems that they tend to go uh, towards the pole, but it's not uh, that clear here either. So uh, the field data are not as convincing as we could hope they would be. And uh, the accuracy of the niche models is, uh, is not. Uh, completely clear. So we have some questions. I saw the, the questions. How reliable are the niche, niche predictions? Uh, how do they relate to other existing approaches? They are not only niche models. You have things that uh, consider the life cycles of, uh, of individuals, for instance, or measure other things on populations. And it would be beneficial to be able to, to relate those different approaches together. And um, could we adopt other uh, mitigation strategies uh, to face climate change? Uh, instead of just switching from one species to the other, could you try something, for instance, to move some seeds around to, um, I don't know, there are lots of ideas out there. But for that, maybe uh, develop uh, uh, other model in connection with those niche models would be interesting. And so what we'll, discuss here in this talk is two possible uh, uh, directions. The first one is to add more on the life cycles of uh, individual to represent actual births, deaths, migration, etc. And then to discuss the phenotypic structure of populations. To include a little bit more on the life cycle, we'll use the most, one of the most famous model of uh, mathematical biology, that is the Fisher KPP model that I will introduce now. So to describe the population, we consider a function that n that takes uh, two variables, time t and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the spatial variable x. So, if we have a n that is something like that, oops, sorry, that is something like that, right? When, so here we represent n of t and dots, right? And the dot is x that is present here. If the function is high like this, it means we have a large population at this location. When n is small, it means we have a smaller population. Okay? And then we'll let time evolve to see how this distribution changes. And this could go to zero, right? This would be the, the tip of the presence of the, of the species. Um, so let's start. We want to, re to include uh, reproduction and competition. Um, so we start with that. And the idea is this is going to go up with birth and go down with death. All right, so we have dt n of t and x, it's equal to a birth rate minus a death rate times the population size that is n of t and x. So the, the death rate, typically what is done uh, is to consider above the fact that one of your offspring will, will reach adulthood, okay? So reaching adulthood is very difficult. On average, uh, when you have one adult 
and the population size is constant, only one of its offspring will uh, will survive, right? So uh, if you consider that trees produce thousands of uh, seeds or birds produce tens of, of uh, eggs, there's a, a big impact, a big, not so many birds that are successful. And so what you do is you consider here that the birth rate is a constant minus something that depends on how much food you have, right? So you have minus n of t x divided by k. Okay, the, impact, the, the, the main impact of uh, overcrowding too many populations will be that the offspring will die when they are very young. And then the death rate, typically you take something constant. And if you do so, you obtain this equation here, so that is a logistic model, and we can recognize two important parameters, R, that is the growth rate of the population, and here K, that is the carrying capacity. So this is, R characterizes how fast the population can grow in the best possible conditions, and K characterizes how many individuals you can have per unit of, uh, of space. Okay, so we have included the logistic model. That's what we have here. And we, we want to complement that with uh, a dispersion, something that will account for uh, the, the spatial structure. So how, how do we do that? Well, we consider here a, a part of the population. What are these individuals going to do? Well, they're going to disperse. So that means they're going to go to a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left. And on the right and the left, we'll have the same thing. This one will also go like that. Okay. So if you, if you consider what is happening in this location X, you will have something like dtx, dt n of t and x. It equal, you lose the population size at that area, at that place, so n minus n of tx. And what you gain is a local average because you, you receive people from a bit everywhere around you. So you have local average of n of t and dots. Okay, so you have this and you have a certain parameter gamma. That's what you get. And you can rescale that to make it as simple as possible. You have to define what is the local average, what you take as gamma, but the simplest thing that you can get is a Laplacian here, okay? So if the Laplacian is positive, it means you are a little bit convex like that, you will tend to go up, right? To reach your local average. And if you're concave, it will push you down, okay? And uh, if we do so, we see, so we have our two parameters, R and K that we had before, and we have the third one, sigma, that uh, characterizes the dispersion. I call it rate, even though it's not real rate, but uh, it's a parameter. And so this model was established uh, this, in the same year, 1937, by two groups of people. First, Fisher, who is uh, uh, someone who works on population genetics, which is part of evolutionary biology, and who is also famous in math because actually he, to study these uh, population genetics things, he did invent a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, statistics concepts and uh, probability concepts. And on the other side, we had Kolmogorov, Petrovsky, and Piskunov. So Kolmogorov, as you know, uh, created a lot of things for probability. Petrovsky was the head of uh, the Academy of Science of Russia. So uh, it's a very well-born model, and it's indeed a very interesting model that is used uh, everywhere in uh, mathematical biology and in ecology in particular. It encapsulates lots of things. You have reproduction, competition, and dispersion in one single uh, short uh, equation. So that's a very interesting thing. Um, so what is the dynamics of this one? Well, actually, the most interesting thing is that it propagates. So if we start from an initial condition like that, well, what we can see 
is that uh, it will go on the side, propagate like that, and then continue again. at a constant speed. So you have a certain speed. And this is understood as an invasion process where you have the species that invades space. So that's a very interesting property, a property that we're going to try to understand uh, here. <clears throat> OK, sorry. OK, so how do we understand that? Well, there's two steps to, to our proof. The first one will be linearization. We want to linearize the, the, the equation. So we get dtm minus Laplacian in xm equals rm. OK, so we skip the competition part. If we do so, we have a special solution that we write m of t x equals exponential minus lambda x minus c t. And um, one can check that actually there is a relation that relates lambda and c. That is called the re dispersion relation. So you would have here lambda and c. You see that if you plug this one in the equation, you will have a lambda c that comes out of the dt. You will have a lambda square that comes out of the Laplacian xm. Okay, and so you get a second order polynomial, and the solution is the, are the c and lambda that are on a parabolic curve like that. So all this you will see in in the exercise class. Okay, so I don't tell you too much, but what is important to remember is that you have a minimal propagation speed C star that is guiding the propagation. And this C star is equal to two square root of R sigma. Okay, and this is the propagation speed that you can see here. So that's the first step. And the second step will be a comparison principle. What do I mean by that? Well, if we consider on one hand uh, our solution n, so this is n, and we have our exponential solution m that is like that. So let's assume that initially uh, at t equals zero, you have m that is strictly bigger than n. Uh, and then, and we define a t bar the first time when they touch. Okay, and they touch at a point that we call x bar. What do we have in x bar? Well, at x bar, we have the values that are the same because they touch. We have the derivative dtn is touching, so it's dtn is bigger than dtm. And the Laplacian, uh, we see that the Laplacian here has to be lower than the Laplacian for m. So we can write uh, we can write then dtn dtn minus Laplacian x n minus r times n, and this is bigger, right, than dtm minus Laplacian x m minus rm. Okay, this comes simply from uh, this thing that we had. Okay, That's, that implies this. But we know also from the equation that this equation on m is equal to minus n square over k, 
while the other one is equal to zero. And so we see that this is impossible. So that's impossible. So they cannot touch. And since they cannot touch, well, M will stay above N at all times. So this is not a complete proof, right? That's a sketch of proof because to show the maximum principle, you need to work a little bit more, but, but that's the main idea. So we have shown that the solution, sorry, the solution N stays below the solution M that itself propagates a speed C star. So at most, N will propagate at a speed C star that is equal to two square root of R sigma. Now, we want to prove that it goes exactly at this speed. So we'll do another thing like that, a similar idea, but from below. So the idea is the same, right? We want, we'll first linearize, linearize the equation. So we have dTm minus Laplacian xm equals r times m. And now we'll put a little bit of a, a little error here, a little epsilon that will help us, okay? And if we do that, and we look for an m that has not uh, m that shifts at a speed a little bit lower than c, star, right? So we'll take a little bit of margin here too. So we'll put a little epsilon for instance. And if we do so, we can find a solution, a special solution M that has a shape like this one. It will have a compact support like that, right? This will be my M like that. And it will shift at the speed C star minus epsilon, that is a little bit smaller than uh, my C star. Okay, to remove. Okay. So if I, I do that, and the idea will be the same as before, I want to have my N that is above, right? And my N should stay above at all times, like that. How do I prove that? Well, I use again the comparison principle. So what happens if the two touch? Well, they cannot touch outside of the support of M because I know that N is positive at all times. It's a population and the diffusion makes it positive everywhere. It cannot touch here. It cannot touch in the corner uh, because the corner is a, is a corner and, and my N is regular. So it has to touch here. And if it touches here, well, I can do the same thing as before. And what I get, right? So same, the same as, um, argument as before. And I get uh, minus N square over K. You remember this is one, right? And since I did put a little bit of margin here, well, I get an epsilon times M. And now what I can do is notice that actually where they touch, I have M that is equal to N. So this is equal to epsilon, uh, epsilon minus N over K times, times M. And then uh, for the equation on M, it's a linear equation. So I can choose, instead of having M, I can choose M tilde that is equal to, let's say, epsilon times M. Okay, uh, the epsilons here are a bit generic, but the idea is uh, epsilon square. Sorry. So this will be equal to epsilon square over K, and so this will be positive. Okay, so if you remember before, the contradiction, sorry, up, the contradiction came from this negative, right? But now we have the M is under the blue curve, not above. So the contradiction comes from the opposite sign, the fact that it's positive, okay? So we have proven here also that um, 
actually the red curve that we have constructed will stay under the blue one at all times. So we have indeed a propagation that is uh, at least at a speed C star minus epsilon for any positive epsilon. So we have a propagation that arrives at the correct speed, which is this two square root of R sigma. Okay, so I said that uh, in the ex exercise section, we would work a little bit on this, uh, on this model. So we'll have a free kind of exercise, uh, a first one where we estimate the propagation speed from the parabolic model, try to see how the, the, uh, the, the propagation happens. Uh, then we'll have a rescaling argument, so how we can include the parameters r, sigma, and k in the formula for the speed without calculating the speed. So that's something that is super useful for applications in biology. And I thought it was interesting to include it. And then at the end, uh, the construction of these lower and super sol solutions. The main intuition to, to have from this model is very simple, right? You have a propagation. You have a front that looks like that. Up, sorry that looks like this with a sharp transition and here a constant speed, okay, that is given by this formula, two square root of R sigma. Okay, this is what we want to rem remember from this part of, of, the, of the talk. And now we'll move to inhomogeneous environments. Why inhomogeneous? Well, if you remember this map here, <clears throat> we had a population that was present in some areas and not in the other ones, and that was due to differences in the environment. So temperature, the precipitation, that wouldn't be the same in uh, here and there. So we need to include this, uh, this heterogeneity. And since we are in a large scale, we will not define precisely the environment. We will not define, for instance, the alternance of different uh, fields or uh, stuff like that, or, or the roads and things like that, but something at a large scale. And so um, a way to do it is to add simply a dependency in X here. And since we are in a large scale, so I will do again a graph, we have our propagation that is like that, with a transition here that is quite sharp because we are in a large scale. and I have my R that evolves slowly, R of X. And so the question is, what is the speed of this transition point X of T, right? X prime of T, what is it equal to? Well, one idea would be, well, actually at, I'm at a large scale. So even though I see here that the R is, uh, is, uh, is not constant, Actually, at the scale of this transition front, the so R will be almost constant. So maybe I can use a speed that I got from the constant environment thing, which is this two R X sigma. So do we have two square root of R of X of T sigma? And the answer is no, which we will really, uh, try to understand now. So let's consider different types of uh, heterogeneity. First, a small scale heterogeneity. So we have here an alternance of uh, different types of crops in a field, right? That's something that is done, for instance, to try to limit the, 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 the pest populations. And the R looks like this. So it's positive uh, in parts of the area and then becomes a little bit negative like this. Okay, that's R of X of epsilon. Okay, so now we have an animal, let's say a kangaroo that goes on this field and he likes only the green ones, these ones, right? So what he, he has as a growth rate uh, R is something periodic like that of a certain period L. And we assume that L is very small. The kangaroo can easily go across this. So what is the kangaroo going to see? Uh, well, the kangaroo 
he feels uh, the average of L of R. The X, right? And uh, actually, this is exactly we can prove that. So indeed, in this case, the propagation occurs at speed two square root of this R bar, this average R times sigma. Okay. So this is a type of limit that is called homogenization. And that is used a lot, uh, for instance, in uh, material science and uh, composite materials and stuff like that. Um, so we see already that this average here is not the same as doing the average of the propagation speed here and there, because the propagation speed here would be positive and here it would be negative, right? So the population would actually stop if we used um, the, the propagation speed that we had before. So we see here already that it breaks down. Let's go to a different uh, scale. So now we have this one. So now we have to cross a large river. Um, so we still have our friend the kangaroo and he faces an environment like that. Here we have a certain R and then here it drops, it becomes really negative and then becomes positive again. It's really negative here because kangaroos don't swim so well, so they have a growth rate that is negative in the water. So how is the population gonna do? Well, it appears here in the east of Australia, and then they propagate happily in this medium and arrive on the edge of the river. And then you have a few of them that try to swim, right? But uh, most of them drown, they die, they don't succeed. But if you wait long enough, you will have one that will succeed to go across like that. And then a few of them, and actually here, once they have crossed, they benefit from a very good environment. And so the population grows again. Okay, so this is very realistic from a, the biology point of view, right? This does happen. You do, do have uh, individuals that cross uh, stretches of water like that. Um, and, uh, and, and it's represented by this model, right? This model does have these dynamics. And the, the, field, the mathematical fields to describe these very rare occurrences of one individual crossing is called uh, large deviations. Okay, in probability. And if you look at uh, PDE, you have a related field which is Hamilton-Jacobi equation. How do you get the Hamilton-Jacobi equation? Well, you need to do a change of variable. You say that N of T and X is actually ex equal to exponential of phi minus phi of T and X divided by epsilon, okay? And if you apply that here with some epsilons like this, which is the right scaling, then you get uh, what you want. And adding the epsilon here is a change of variable uh, of T and X. Okay, I don't want to go too far into the detail, but then you can write uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation on phi. So this is something that is existing. But what we are interested here, is interested in here, is something at an even larger scale than that, right? We want to consider the propagation of a tree species across a whole continent. So we are in this situation here. We still have our kangaroo, and this time they try to cross all the way to New Zealand. Okay, so what do we have mathematically? Well, we have an R, that, sorry, an R that is positive and then becomes negative for a very long time and becomes positive again in New Zealand. And the propagation is the same as before in the good part of Australia. And then what's going to happen? Well, if we consider this model, this model doesn't really see a difference between this and the thing we had before. So you will also have some kangaroos that will try to swim. 
most of them will die, will drown, but eventually you will have one that will cross all the way to New Zealand and you will have an emergence of kangaroos in New Zealand. As we know, this did not happen, right? We don't have any uh, kangaroo in New Zealand. And so this model is not very satisfactory from a biological point of view. Um, so here the example is a bit extreme, but uh, I did draw here another example that uh, shows that the problem is deeper than we could imagine. So I consider here a situation similar to what we had before, like that. So uh, R of X, that would be equal to plus or minus one, right? And a period that is big L. And I try to see the speed of propagation across an environment like that. So when L is very small, what you see is the average of R. If you remember well, that was a homogenization thing. And so the average of R uh, is zero here. So the propagation has speed zero. So we have the speed here. The speed is zero. And if we increase L, actually, the speed increases. Why does it increase? Because the good areas are gathered together, right? They are packed. And so we are less likely to go in the bad areas by, by mistake. Okay, so actually the propagation speed increases and it never stops increases, even if L is very big. Okay, so that's a problem because we know that if the stretch of bad area of bad environment is too long, the individual will not succeed to cross. They will die en route. Okay, so there's a problem here. And what we'll try to do now is to propose an alternative uh, asymptotics where we'll be able to say that the kangaroos do not succeed to cross the oceans. So to, that, to do so, we'll define an individual base model. Should have put a capital letter here. What is an individual base model? Is a model where we represent individual uh, individuals, sorry. So to do so, we are we need to discretize space. So this was this is our x, but instead of having a continuous space, now we have a we have discretized it like that, right? We have different dims, and in each dims we define a certain number of of uh, individuals. That is the capacity, so the carrying capacity of a, of a dim that is finite. It's big N for us. And so the number of individual is the one that they did paint blue here. We see that there are at most N of them. And there can be zero if everything is white. So we can define similarly to before the rightmost particle, that would be the position of the front. I call it M. Right, M of T here, the rightmost particle. And the idea is to relate it to the X of T that we had before. Okay. So what is the asymptotic that we had before and what is the asymptotic that we propose now? So we start from an individual based model and the two main coefficients for this model are N, so the population, sorry, population size, right? And we have epsilon, that is a scale of the heterogeneity. And what we did to obtain the continuous model, that is the Fisher KPP model, So we didn't do it, but you can do it by simply let n go to infinity. So I don't do it because there are also other parameters, for instance, uh, the discretization of space that makes things a little bit more complicated. But the idea is really, this is just a large population limit and you get the feature KPP. And then we explain that you had epsilon, the state of heterogeneity associated to uh, uh, actually a hyperbolic scaling in T and X. And if you do that, you obtain this Hamilton Jacobi equation. And what we want to do to propose here is an alternative route 
which is to do the, the, those two limits in a different order. So we do first epsilon go to zero, we would get here a stochastic interface. So this M of T, a description of the dynamics of this M of T, and then we would do uh, N go to infinity, and this, just like in this case here, would remove the stochasticity, and we would have a deterministic interface. Okay, and what we will show is actually this interface does have exactly the dynamics x of t that we proposed at first, where x prime of t is equal to two square root of r of x of t times sigma. Okay. <clears throat> so how can we prove something like that? Well, um, so um, the first idea is to move to remove the competition. So just like what we did for the Fisher KPP, the first step would be linearization. Okay, so here is the same model as before. Simply, we remove the size constraint on each team. The population can grow, you see, as much as it wants here. Okay, so if we do that, uh, we have no competition. That means no interaction between population, be, between individuals, right? We don't have any interaction. The so interaction was only through uh, this competition. And this simplifies a lot, especially if we notice that the probability of having m bigger than something, so m bigger than x of t, can be bounded by an expectancy an expectancy of the quantity, which is just how many people are on the right of X of T. And what we gain with this one is that this is a linear quantity. We have a linear quantity on a process with no interaction. And so actually we can compute that by just the expectancy of the position of individuals. And this is given by exactly our uh, m of t and x dx between x of t and infinity, where dtm minus sigma Laplacian xm equals rm. Okay, so we have exactly the same thing as before. And we are able to use the property of the PD to show, to, to, to get a value for that, okay? This was uh, the, on the process without competition. Then we need to compare the propagation of the thing with linearization and without linearization. And we'll do an argument that is similar to what we had before. So before we used the comparison theorem, Right, so if you remember, we had uh, something, the N that was like that, the N was that was underneath, and we compared it to a M here, right? And we said that if they are ordered initially, they will be so in the future too. Now here is more difficult because it's a stochastic thing. So this one can be very noisy like that, and the one underneath can be noisy too. And so if you just run simulation on both, you will not have uh, orders that will be kept in time. So what you need to do is not just a comparison theorem like that, that we could think of, but actually something that is called a coupling argument. A coupling between the two processes. And what is it? Well, um, the processes, you need to build them, right? You need to show that there exists a process that defines the population with competition and to have a process that defines the one without competition. And what you will do is you will build 
the process with competition, you get the blue individual. And then complete it with the extra uh, individuals uh, that you get when you when you neglect competition. Okay, so this is what we do here, and these ones, uh, these extra individual, you put, put them in red. Okay, this is what I did here. So here I have the one without competition, right? So this is with a, a growth rate that is R of X times one minus N over K, right? And then on top of that, I add the red ones, right? And these ones, they are made so that the sum of those two will be the growth rate without competition. So here I have a R of X, N over K. That's the growth rate, the, the rates. Okay? And when I consider both colors, actually I have the linear one. When I consider only the blue one, I have the one uh, with uh, with the competition, okay? And I can iterate that in time, and I get for each omega, uh, omega by omega, in terms of probability, I will have the two solutions that will be ordered. Okay, so that's an equivalent to uh, the comparison theorem, uh, but it's much more powerful. You can do comparison uh, arguments that are more subtle than that. Okay, the last argument is, um, where we'll see the difference between uh, the stochastic argument and the one we had for the priority. So now what we start with is m of t, right? And the difference between m of t and x of t is that I know that there are no one, there's no one ahead of m of t. It's completely empty. So actually the propagation uh, of the population does not depend on R, the value of R on the right of M of T. M of T. And so to, to take advantage of that, I compare with the solution without competition like that, right? So this one will grow, and since there is no competition, actually it will uh, grow much more than the other one, so it will be something like that after a while, right? I know that the blue thing is under this one, Okay, and then uh, if I continue like that, I will have an infinite population size here for the linear process. And that's not good because if you consider the linear the one without regulation of the population size, you will just recover the PDE. So we define a certain time delta T, sorry, a certain time delta T, and then we reinitiate the population taking this m of t plus delta t, right? And bounding this, saying that the population blue is under a certain curve that is equal here to n, right? And here located in m of t plus delta t. So I know that I'm under that because I'm on the left of the m of t's that is given by the red curve. And I'm always lower than N because I have a regulation of the population size. Okay, so I do again a coupling argument here and I restart from that. So I will have my new red solution that will be like this and will grow again like that. Okay, and this is how I see the difference between the PDE where I always had people ahead of my X of T and this one. Now for the lower estimate, well, I do something similar, right? Um, the idea is also to have um, 
uh, a process, a stochastic process without competition that is under this one. And the propagation of this lower thing will push the blue solution to the right. Now, when I do something lower, I need to be a bit more careful because uh, I cannot do use the trick that I had before of estimating the priority by the expectation. Okay, it doesn't work, but there is a trick that uh, is going to be present in the exercise class where you can actually estimate that through a probability of the square of the number of people that have, you have on the right of x of t. Okay, that's a, a simple argument, cauchy schwarz uh, argument. Um, and it can be used to, to, to prove things. Um, one uh, comment is that this is no longer a linear uh, quantity. Okay, and so to compute that, you cannot just rely on the PDE. Okay, it's, a, it's a, uh, something, the priority of having two people that did go on the right of X of T will uh, take into account the structure, the genealogy of the process. So that becomes really uh, a stochastic object. Okay, so the final result that we can get is this one. If we have N, N that is large, but not too large compared to one over epsilon. So this is what I write here. We have epsilon that needs to be very small compared to one. And we need to have this one that is even smaller than uh, epsilon, right? Then we have a propagation that is at the same speed as this OD that we have here, explicit OD. And this happens with priority very close to one. And we can use that in simulation. So that's something that I we have done with uh, two students uh, from the master uh, of uh, life mathematics for life sciences that we have here. And they showed, they did build a numerical code. So you start from a fictitious uh, species here, a square here, and you see that it propagates preferentially along the cool uh, Alps, right? Where the temperature are low, and then it propagates outwards toward, warm, towards warmer temperature, and it almost stops where it becomes really hot. Okay, so you can use in practice this formula. And then there is a work to try to compare this to the niche models, and this is something that is not done yet. Okay, so in the exercise session, as I told you, it will be related to this also. You will see those two estimates, right, the priority of having something that is less than the expectancy, and then the probability that is bigger than an expectancy square over an expectancy of something square, right? And this you will do on the Galton-Watson model, which is a model, a branching model, very close to what we have here without uh, the spatial structure. Okay, so you don't have any questions so far? I will move to the last part of the talk about local adaptation. So not all trees are born equal. So um, we have these uh, little flowers. These little flowers are called Capsella bursa pastoris, right? So they, they are annual flowers They grow again, they die every year and they produce some seeds. And an interesting feature of this flowers is that they are present almost everywhere on the globe, right? And that's something surprising because uh, you have very different climates. So they are present in desertic areas as well as uh, very cold, cold places. So that's something surprising. So they gathered, they, they received some attention of biologists. And what they have done is this here that is called a common garden. experiment. So a common garden experiment is you collect some seeds from these little flowers in different places and you bring all of them to one field like that and you grow them together. You grow them in the same conditions. So you don't, you will not see uh, the impact of the 
local conditions on the growth of the plants. This is something that you call plasticity, right? And this uh, it's something that uh, can hide the evolutionary uh, properties of the of the species. So that's why you grow them together. And then you are able to compare the growth of these different seeds. And here are the type of uh, of uh, results that they get. So each line is a different uh, type of seeds from different places. And what they measure is when the flowers uh, produce some, uh, I mean, when you produce some flowering, right? This is called phenology, the timing of uh, the flower onset or other uh, event for, for species. And it's very useful because it's easy to measure. We see that some species like this one produce their flowers very early in the season and all at the same time. Whereas you have other seeds that produce flowers later in the season and over an extended period of time. So these seeds and those seeds Almost they are the same species in the sense that they can reproduce together. You can use the pollen of this one to um, uh, on the, the on the pistils of these ones. Although they can reproduce, they are actually really different. And this is how we can understand the ones that flower very early. Actually, they come from seeds from southern Cali southern California here close to the Death Valley that is here, right? So it's a very hot area. And when it's very hot, you should flower early to avoid overheating. Produce your seed, your flowers early, get your seeds done, and then just die, okay? So this is a strategy that is uh, targeted for by these plants here. On the north here, it's different. They come from areas where it can be cold, it can freeze at night and free frost is very bad for uh, seed production. So if you want to avoid frost, you should produce your flowers later in the season and extend them to uh, uh, so that at least some of the seeds will be produced. So we see that those two populations of flowers are actually quite different. And if you remember what we did about the niche models where we defined the conditions where a species can survive, you understand that the one that comes from here would not be able to survive in the desert. And the reverse would be also true. Okay, so there is a local adaptation and that's a challenge because if we think of the dynamics of species submitted to climate change, we should not only focus on where the population is gonna be, but actually the whole phenotypic structure of the population. And this is something that is present a bit everywhere. Here are different um, different uh, type of uh, of uh, vegetables, trees that you know much better. So this is the oak. This is a birch tree. This is epicea. And this is a pine tree. Okay. And in each of these cases, they measure some things. We don't really need to bother about what it is, but what we see is that there's a clear cline that is a local adaptation. Depending on the latitude, which is a proxy for the temperature, we see that these characteristics, this phenotype changes. Okay, so there is a local adaptation that is present in almost all the species we know. So this problem of uh, structure is really important. So I mentioned the notion of uh, phenotypic trait. So that's important. Um, and it is uh, a quantity that you can measure on, on individuals. And here we assume that is it is fully heritable. So you copy it from your parents, except if you have some mutations. And an example here could be the date of flower onset, right? This could be a phenotype. Or if we uh, accept that this timing of the flower onset is an adaptation to temperature, we could choose the temperature to which an individual is best adapted to. This could be a phenotype. And this is what we want to have in mind for, for, for our talk. <clears throat> so now we'll consider a population N like before, but instead of having just the time T 
and the special variable x will add an extra variable y, which is our phenotypic trait. And when we represent the population, we'll have the special trait here. So this is space, like before. And now uh, on this axis, we'll have y, the trait of the population. And then we have uh, two colors. We have the blue one, that means small population, with uh, this location x and trait y. And if it's, uh, on the contrary, a red or yellow color, it means that we have a large population. So what we can say here is that uh, in this location here, you have individuals with uh, y more or less equal to minus 10. And here we have individuals with uh, y more or less equal to 10. And if we go further than that, we have almost no individual. Okay, I hope this, this graph is clear for, for everyone. So let's now define the model. We'll have, as I said, a population N that depends on three variable, T, X, Y. And we have some operators that are similar to what we had before. So we have here, we recognize the dispersion, just as in the case of the Fisher KPP model. We have here the linear growth. Here again, it's the same as the Fisher KPP. And here we have a competition. So the competition here, this time, it has an integral on it. The integral is in trait and here, but not in X. It means that we are in competition with everyone that is present in the same location as me, independently of their trait Y. So in competition with all traits present in location X. And finally, we'll have a last operator, that is this one, which models mutations. Okay, mutations are also with the Laplacian. You could have a small parameter here, but with some rescaling, we can remove this parameter. And the idea is mutation is not that different from dispersion because actually when you, you are born, you can uh, be born with a, a, a trait that is a little bit different from your parents, a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. Okay, so we have this, this model and we can now define the coefficient R. So we have here R, T, X, Y, and we'll be a bit more specific than that. We will consider a situation where we have a client, uh, uh, local adaptation. So to survive, so this is local adaptation. To survive in T and X, you need a trait y that is not too far from b times x minus ct, okay? okay? So bx is this one, right? It means here you should have a trait y that is small and here to survive, you need to try have a trait that is large, okay? You shouldn't be too far from this line here. And the effect of climate change is to shift all this northwards. So is the effect of climate change. And uh, the climate change is something that is imposed from the outside. So it happens at a given speed C. Okay, it's not the speed like before where we had a propagation that itself created a speed. Here the speed is imposed by the climate change. And the, the questions that we were gonna wonder is, are, is whether the population will be able to survive 
And if it survives, what it's gonna dynamics is gonna be. So we have here a little movie. So you recognize here the trait, the optimal phenotypic trait. So to survive, you shouldn't be too far from that. You see that here the population is present here, so not too far from this trait. And we'll see how it changes when with the climate change. So I will play the simulation. So what we see is that the population stays not too far from this uh, optimal trait that is shifting northwards, so to the right. And not only does it succeed to survive, but we see that it propagates along this trait, this optimal phenotypic trait. Okay. So this propagation is not too different in nature to the one we had for Fisher KPP, and we can try to, to see, to describe it. Um, we notice that to survive, if we remember what we said about uh, the niche models, the niche model would say that actually the trait of the population do not change. So this, if you believe that, the niche model, the population should not evolve. So this is um, if you have, if you, if no evolution, you should just shift northward, not change. And what we see here is something a bit different. We see that the population does shift towards the north, but also evolves at the same times. So you have shift plus evolution. And you could have something even more extreme. You could just stay at the same place, not shift, and just evolve to resist higher temperatures. And this is something that has been seen in field studies. So here is the same uh, graph as what I did show you. You have here the initial population. They say here is the breeding date, so the phenotypic trait. And here you have the, po the latitude, which is uh, the, the, the position X for us, right? And they say you can have different strategies. Either you could shift, not evolve, and shift your location or you could not move and evolve towards a larger temperature or do intermediate uh, strategies. And they have gone to bird populations in North America. And what I did see is that these uh, birds did adapt to what warmer temperature over the years. Here you have, uh, they, did, they produce their eggs earlier in the season, 8.6 days early. Okay, so you have an adaptation to the climate. So this could explain the diversity of uh, results we saw in the field study at the beginning of the talk. So to prove the propagation, I will not do it in detail, but you have uh, two main difficulties that I want to, disc to introduce. So the first one, if you remember the propagation, um, you had what you propagate not uh, on one line, you don't propagate like that in a 1D thing, you propagate along a certain optimal phenotypic trait. And there's actually a selection profile around this one, right? When I say that you need to be close to this one to survive, it means there's a selection towards this, uh, this line here, okay? And so it's a propagation is with uh, this profile, and this can be taken into account by replacing the growth that was dTn minus Laplacian xn of the linearized one, so the m, we had rm, right? And actually, we, sh we should substitute this r that is not no longer a growth that is just pointwise, but with a maximal eigenvalue of an elliptic problem like that. Right? This is an eigenvalue problem, and this R L infinity defines the maximal growth rate, and this is what we should employ here. Okay, so there's a little bit of technicality, but it's the same kind of argument as what we have seen for the Fisher KPP model. And another difficulty comes from this non-local competition term. Why is it a problem? Well, if you if we look at our argument, we had Sorry, we had a solution here that we wanted to, 
to, sh to be smaller than another one like that. Well, if we, what we said is we want to show that if they encounter like that, if they touch, the blue one cannot cross. But if you have a non-local competition like that, actually being under the other one is an advantage because you will have less competition. So when you have something like that, you can have a crossing. Okay, so the, that adds a difficulty. But uh, actually, we are okay because we can use uh, Harnack inequality. And the Harnack inequality is something that allows us to, um, to um, estimate the value of, a, of uh, a solution N given a local value. So if we consider a, a position X point like that, we, and if the value of n is very small, we can say that actually n cannot be very big, not too far from it, right? A distance one, for instance. Because if it's very big like that, it will need to go down to the other one. And we know that n is positive. So actually you will need to do a very sharp turn like that. Okay, you have a really sharp turn which will in practice imply that one of these uh, Laplacian will be very big. And you cannot have that because the rest is relatively small. So you cannot have sharp turns. So this is an argument that is very well known and, uh, uh, for elliptic equations, right? When you, have, when you don't have a DTN, if you have a DTN, it's a bit more difficult because you don't have this Laplacian in T. But this is something that was solved uh, to adapt this with time. It was solved, solved by people like Nash, uh, De Georgi, and Moser, right? It was solved in the 1960s. And so we can take advantage of, of this work. And it allows you to compare this non-local term with a local term, okay? Because you have this control uh, local control implies uh, control on a ball. Okay, if you do that, you can show this result, which tells you that actually you have a maximal climate change speed, C star star, and the situation is as follows. If C star stars, if your, the climate change that you consider is bigger than this critical one, then the population uh, goes extinct. So if climate change faster than C star star, you have extinction. Uh, otherwise, survival. And you can describe the propagation, the, 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 the dynamics of the range of the population with this formula. I will uh, conclude soon. Let me mention two applications of that. The first one is, well, when we have those speeds, so the, so the critical speed C star star and the speed here of the range of the, of the species, it's all explicit. And when, because it's explicit, it means it's very useful for biologists because we can study uh, we can get some complicated uh, formula like that through some rescaling, right? I said that rescaling is something central. It allows you to, to get complicated formula. And you can consider the impact of one of the parameters, for instance. So typically, you will be interested in field data for different species. So here you have oak, right? Econ from oak. And you will have a uh, maple tree. Right, And the difference between the two is that these ones fall down while these ones fly away. So this one can dissipate, uh, disperse a lot more than those ones. So you will have a sigma that is a dispersion rate that is very different from the two. And you can try to see if in the field data, you recover the difference between these trees that are quite similar for parameters um, other than sigma, if you see the difference between the two, the, the two species. So that's one application. And you can also, for instance, discuss which types of species are the most at risk with uh, climate change, etc. 
Another application is this one. So here we consider uh, an environment that is a little bit more complicated. So what we had before was an optimal trait that was something like that. And now we'll add here at the end an environment that is very good for the species, a bit better than the normal one along, uh, along this line. And the population will be present here initially. And we'll wonder what is the con consequence of uh, climate change. So after the climate change, this thing will appear here, right? That's, uh, uh, that's the climate change. What, what can happen? Well, two things can happen. The population can either survive here, right? Or it can survive by adopting this mixed strategy that we discussed and be present here. Um, it can also fail to propagate either by just shifting the, the range or fail to evolve to go here. Uh, so all the, the combination are possible, but one thing that you can prove is if you survive both here and there, then you will survive everywhere in between. So the population will be present everywhere in between. And since this one, you see that uh, you have different angles here, you have here a fast propagation of the population. So you see that if you inclu include a, a little bit more complexity in the model, more heterogeneity, so this is a heterogeneity of the impact of temperature on species, on the species, well, you see that you can have some patterns that are very different from what we had before. Here you can have a fast propagation of the population, and this fast pro propagation will really be due to the fact that you have these two modes of survival and not to how safe the population is in terms of climate change. So you could have a population that propagates very fast like that. And then if you increase the climate change just a little bit, the population could uh, disappear altogether. Okay, so that's, uh, that brings an interesting uh, insight from uh, the biological point of view. Okay, for the exercise session, we'll have a third part. Uh, that will not be on this uh, phenotypic thing, but rather on a model where you have two scales that are present. You'll have a rapid scale, right? Something that rapid, happens rapidly. You uh, will consider some uh, some individuals that can hide or collect food, right? And this happens a lot during their lifetime. And we'll see how we can combine this with a slower dynamics, which is the growth of the population. So we'll do it in a heuristic way, and then we'll see how we can consider that with rigorous results. Um, that's the time of my conclusion. Um, so what we have from ecology, I think we have a, a lot of very interesting mathematical questions and models that appear. A uh, lot of uh, mathematical models that include uh, models that have been developed earlier with other applications inside typically models that have been created for mathematical physics, but with questions that are a bit different. And, uh, and so it's interesting to interact with uh, existing work and to, 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 to see how the, a different approach, a different angle can, uh, can, can change what we say. Uh, an interesting aspect is that you interact with lots of different people, lots of different ideas. So you will propose a result that you will get with your PDs, for instance, and someone will bring uh, either some uh, field studies that seem completely unrelated or some simulation on, uh, on a, a lattice or something like that, and you'll have to interact with these people. And that's an interesting uh, challenge. The last one is um, in all that I have been uh, talking about here, the only impact of uh, humans would be the climate change, but actually uh, humans have a lot more impact on ecosystems than that. And uh, there's a great challenge for us and for biologists to include the humans in, in biological works. 
Uh, finally, a uh, word on climate change. Uh, so I really believe that this is going to be the main problem that we'll face in the 21st century. And so it's really interesting if, if uh, more people could try to work on the many problems that uh, climate change raises. Okay, so I think that's the uh, end of my talk. Thank you very much for this very interesting introduction to these mathematical models. Please join me in thanking Gael Raoul for his lecture. Thank you. I will now call for questions. Uh, I remind you that you have to type your questions and then so I can see them and then ask them to the speaker. There, there are already some questions. Um, there's a question from Tim Chiaran. Uh, could you please uh, re-explain the, the model about the kangaroos crossing the river? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so... Sorry. So kangaroo crossing the river. Well, um, my point was that you have, uh, you can have phenomena in Belgium. Uh, you have several problems where the same phenomena are involved, but the scalings are different. And different scalings lead to different dynamics. So uh, when you consider the propagation of a species, uh, here you have an obstacle, right? Uh, kangaroos usually they do not cross rivers like that. So it's something that will not happen a lot. Um, uh, but you can describe those rare events, right? You can describe uh, sometimes uh, kangaroos will be, for instance, will fall on the water, right? They will be carried away by the, the stream and then they will try to reach either side of the river and eventually some of them will arrive on the other side and then you will have uh, a few of them that will succeed to do that they will reproduce together and they will cross um, the point is uh, when you do that you have uh, so you have individuals that are falling in the water and there is very little uh, interaction between the kangaroos in the river so actually what you have is independent events of uh, crossing attempts, let's say. And the repetition of these independent events means that you will be able to characterize uh, the probability that they will succeed. And this is exactly uh, the concept of large deviation. You will have an attempt like that, it will die at some point, Right, and you will characterize the probability of it uh, succeeding, and you have a certain, uh, yeah, there's a certain scaling. This is a whole range of uh, of uh, large deviation, uh, but the model is not really specified here. But you typically what you would have is uh, a an individual that would defi be defined by his position x of t, and this would just be a Brownian motion, right? And then you would have a clock. Right? You would say that you have a time t of its death, right? And so the time t of its death would be exponential uh, time of death. And you would wonder what is the probability of x of t larger than a certain quantity l uh, and t less than big t. Right? What is the probability that he crosses before he dies? And for this, you can characterize this quantity here. It will be like exponential minus something times L. Okay. Well, well if you have some reproduction, well, uh, something like that. I don't know if that answers the questions. The question, sorry. I, I think I think it uh, it will have yes. Thank you very much for coming back to this model. Uh, here are some other questions. Here's a question from um, Matvey Sirianov. How far in time should we predict 
using mathematical models and what problems occur with that? Um, okay. Um, actually, at the moment, we are not trying to predict. So that's a, that's a, that's a very good point, actually. Um, the point would be, well, what are we trying to do here? And why are those niche models used so much? Well, um, what is really interesting with these niche models is that we know what we are doing. We are just taking the environmental conditions that we consider now and seeing where these are going to be met in the future. Okay, so this here is perfectly defined and can be seen as independent of the location of the species in the future. So you, you could combine it, let's say, with verbal argument to say, well, we know that this area is going to be favorable, and here it's going to be bad, for instance. And so then we expect to have a degradation of the quality of, of the species uh, in this area, something like that, right? You don't say the species is going to be there. And so that's a drawback of that, right? So what does it mean, this gray area, in terms of population is not very clear, but it has an advantage, which is you don't pretend more than what you can prove. And when you consider the mathematical models that we propose, well, it's, we are much more assertive. We say that the population propagates like that. And we know that this is not true. For instance, here, we, we skip um, the time it takes from an individual to go from uh, seed to adult in the sense of uh, an adult can produce seeds himself, right? We neglect that. And when we do that, we make a mistake on the propagation speed that is huge. Okay, so um, I think this shouldn't be taken as real prediction uh, method, but more one of the elements of the discussions that we can have. Okay, so if you um, so it's, I don't see it as a prediction of what's going to happen. So it's a bit, uh, uh, it's not very coherent with the, with this, this graph, this graph here, right? I said this is ongoing work, so it's not really clear what we're going to do with this kind of sim simulation, and this is something we'll have to discuss a lot with biologists. Um, it cannot be seen as a direct simulation to estimate what's going to happen. Also, because we don't include human events on that. Uh, but what I think is that it can provide an in, uh, uh, interesting insight for some more complicated uh, situations that we haven't seen now. So a good example is the last application that I presented. This one, right, where we see here a fast propagation of the population even though the population is not in an especially good uh, good situation, right? We can have some uh, some uh, some features that we cannot see with simpler models, and so um, yeah, so, so so it's not direct application. It's to give some ideas and some new uh, point of view that we didn't have before. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it, it's not. Uh, it's not simple to know what we are doing when we are creating those prediction maps. It's true. Thank you very much. There's another question from Stefan Pajaniraja. Are the models that you presented also applicable to humankind? And if not, could you mention some other models that are? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, sure. Um, so the adaptation, I, 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 local adaptation, I don't think, I don't think this has been proven. You know that uh, the humans have a, uh, the wave of advance of the humans uh, after uh, the Paleolithic uh, age were very fast. So I don't know if there was time to have some local adaptation. I'm not sure, but uh, you have ideas like that. So especially, the Fisher KPP model has been employed. Uh, extensively for, so, sorry, uh, well, I will stay with that actually, um, has been employed for the wave of uh, humans uh, propagating through space during the Paleolithic age. 
uh, it has been also used to to see the propagation of uh, cultural habits like agriculture things like that uh, so that's that's one aspect it's used a lot for for this because it's very simple right simple integrates many different things so it's a ba uh, good basis to discuss things just like i've said with the prediction is not a problem of doing some uh, predictions but discussing the contrast right when you have two different uh, species for instance how do they behave di differently it's more something like that than really describing the propagation and another aspect that has been done a lot for humans is when you have uh, in the or based model like that with a population like, size like that uh, <clears throat> you have um, a few individuals that are in front like that and these reproduce and actually they can reach the full capacity like that right they can be present everywhere and they will kind of block the arrival of new people from the rear so you have constant uh, overtaking of a few individuals that will produce all the descendants and this has an impact this very specific genealogy you get Balthasar and Stigmat genealogy, so you can describe uh, this, the impact of the spatial structure on the, uh, the branching structure of the population. And this has an impact to uh, allow for bad mutations, for instance, to fix. If you are in a well-mixed population, the bad, uh, the bad genes will be erased by selection. But in this case, the selection is not as efficient because the branches process is not the same. If you're ahead of the population, even if you have some defect, you can actually still uh, uh, be the one that will create all the offspring. Okay? And this has an impact of uh, you will continuously introduce some little defect mutations. And that's something that you can see actually in the DNA uh, data. So if you follow, if you want to recreate uh, the wave of propagation of, the ne of humans in the Neolithic age, you can follow actually uh, some uh, mutations that are bad, but not very bad, of course, it's not terrible things, but you have an accumulation of uh, mutations that are uh, not beneficial uh, through the, the propagation. So if you go, let's say, to Africa, to Southern Europe, Northern Europe, etc., you see it. And you see it also in things much more recent, for instance, in uh, in Quebec, you had the, the European colons that arrived in Quebec and it propagated along a valley that was very narrow and difficult to access. And so along this valley, you see a progress of uh, uh, genetic defects. So you do see these kind of things in, in human populations. Now that you have a lot more missing, I, I don't know if it's, uh, if you can see features like that nowadays. I don't know. Very interesting. Another question from Sebastian Simon. What kind of branches of mathematics are applied in mathematical models for ecology analysis, statistics, probability, combinatorics? Um, well, there is a lot of, of mathematics, actually. Uh, and we discover new types of mathematics every day. I think, uh, I really think all mathematics are useful for mathematical biology. It's, uh, it's much more diverse, I think, than, uh, let's say, physics. Uh, everything is useful. Um, historically, I think um, the first thing that came into play for, for biology were dynamical systems, right? So if you remember people like uh, uh, René Tom, for instance, who got the film medal a while back, he was interested in his later part of life by dynamical systems uh, and chaos theory, things like that, that appeared first in, in biology. So a lot of uh, questions in dynamical systems uh, have some origin of, or part of the, their origin in uh, mathematical biology. Um, you have, uh, well, statistics are born with, with these kind of questions, uh, probability also. Um, yeah, I think um, yeah, you can find all sorts of mathematics. Uh, I think the the difference with uh, with uh, mathematical physics is that the the models are not as well set as in physics. So in physics, for instance, you have a lot of work. Let's say 
in fluid mechanics, for instance, on Navier-Stokes equation or earlier equation, trying to prove that there exists some solution and stuff like that. And, and so you have uh, very profound work that is done uh, because you know that the, the models are not going to change. Uh, in biology, uh, for each problem that you consider, you have a model that is slightly different. So I would say that we have a, a less profound analysis on specific models. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe, uh, I, maybe algebra would be a bit less uh, common, but there are some people uh, like, I know Gromov at EHOS, he does, uh, he tries to develop very abstract concepts for biology, for uh, especially uh, development, right? Uh, biology of development in the line of, uh, that was said by uh, Alan Turing, for instance, but I don't know how, how apply it is. Thank you very much. Here's now another question from Huang Nguyen uh, about PDEs arising from ecology. Do we have to solve them completely by numerical methods or estimating solutions and discovering their theoretical properties are enough? Yes, so, um, so I would say that you can do simulations, uh, right? So this is, for instance, what I, I did with, uh, uh, with this uh, propagation of, uh, so here I, I did use uh, actually uh, like a fast marching, which is a, a, a numerical method. Um, but as the, the simulations are not what biologists love the most because um, with simulations, when you change a little bit the model, you can obtain very different things. Right, and simulations they can do a lot. They do simulations, stochastic simulations, a bit less uh, PDE simulation, but still they can do some. Uh, they do a lot of uh, simulation on lattice or stuff like that, and they are a bit uh, skeptical about it because there are lots of papers in biology journals about that, and people who do uh, field work or experiments where testing one thing takes a lot more time than a simulation. Um, don't have a very, always a very positive uh, opinion of simulations. And so uh, I think simulation can be used to get some ideas, but the thing that the biologists value more is really some like uh, um, uh, analytical result, analytical limits, uh, description of the qualitative behavior of solutions, uh, more than the simulations, I would say. So, yeah. So it would be yeah, the, the type of result that you can sell to biologists are uh, qualitative dynamics of, of uh, models. Existence of solutions is not easy to, to sell and simulations uh, has to be justified a lot, right? Because uh, it's not really clear wh what, what you can get out of a, a given simulations. Thank you, that's a very interesting answer. Uh, this will conclude our uh, question session, so please join me again in thanking uh, Raoul for his very nice and interesting lecture. Mm -hmm.